Please, Ingrid. Yeah, thank you very much for this nice introduction. And um, so my talk today is going to be about common and rare genetic variants for coronary artery. A bit closer. Oh, sorry. Do you hear me now? <laughs> um, uh, rare, va rare variants for a coronary artery disease, and my focus is uh, on the rare variants. So um, coronary artery disease is the number one killer in the industrialized world, and in Germany, around 200,000 people die of myocardial infarction each year. And so we know that uh, coronary artery disease has its, uh, or there are many, very many uh, environmental factors actually influencing coronary artery disease, but we also know that there is a strong genetic predisposition. And so in order to identify the genetic risk factors for coronary artery disease, there have been applied several different strategies over the last 20 years. And so it all started with Canada gene studies in the 1990s that were followed by linkage studies. And what really unraveling the genetic cause of coronary artery disease started in 2006 when the first genome-wide association studies were applied. And so during the last seven years, um, genome-wide association studies have been tremendously successful in order to identify the loci that are associated with coronary artery disease. So these are the loci that are identified so far, and those that are marked with red dots here are those that were identified in the so-called first wave of genome-wide association studies. And, and these red dots are um, actually the odds ratio of these SNPs, and one general finding of these, uh, this first wave of genome-wide association studies is that these, um, this, uh, this, this, these loci have really small effect size. So typically, we have an effect size between 1.1 and 1.4. So in order to also identify those variants that have even smaller effect size, we had to increase the sample size because even though these were really large GVAS back then, consisting of 3,000 cases and controls, today you have a big large meta-analysis where you have several thousand uh, cases and control. So for example, the Cardiogram Consortium collected uh, 22,000 cases and 60,000 control. Uh, which is uh, obviously an increase in sample size. And these were able to actually identify, um, so these large meta-analyses were able to identify um, variants that had an odds ratio below 1.1. So to wrap up what genome association studies have found during the last seven years, and just one slide, we have 46 loci now that we know increase the risk of coronary artery disease. But most of these have really small effect size. So we, we have a range of uh, 1.05 to 1.25. But the most disappointing finding is that uh, these laws explain only 12% of the genetic risk, so of the genetic heritability. So that means that 90% are still left to be identified. And most of the pathomechanisms uh, are still unresolved for these loci. So where do we go from here? So in Lübeck, uh, our group concentrate now on the 1,000 genomes imputation. So, so what this method actually does is that you increase your number of loci that you put into your analysis so that you now also focus on those variants that have not been uh, um, evaluated so far. And in this way, you hope. And these are typically um, variants that are uh, rare. And, uh, so, and with this method, you hope that you can identify new loci that haven't been looked at so far. You also perform in-depth pathway analysis and uh, expression in QTLs and in order to identify the disease pathways that underlie the disease. And we also have several uh, knockout models, so knockout mice developed for several of the um, genes, the corresponding genes of the first wave of genome-wide association studies. So let me again come back to the so-called missing heritability. So that means the fact that we have only 12% explained of the genetic risk. And this is a standard or a diagram that is often used in order to explain why we have only identified 12%. So um, I'm also going to try to explain it using this diagram. And so what you have um, on the y-axis, you have the effect size. And on the x-axis, you have the, the frequency of the variance. And the genome association studies have identified these variants lying on this right side here. So, and typically for coronary artery disease, we have common variants with, um, uh, with a low effect size. We don't really expect these variants uh, for uh, CAD. So in order to actually identify the, the, uh, yeah, the rest of the, of, of the genetic risk, we think that we have to move towards the left of this diagram. And this is the low frequency variance and the rare variance. And these low frequency variance, these are the variants that we believe can still be identified using genome-wide association studies if you increase the numbers of SNPs into our analysis and perhaps also adjust the statistical uh, evaluation. But these variants that lie here are too rare, so we do not expect to find them uh, using GWAS. 
But the good thing about these variants is that they have a really strong effect. And, and these variants are rare in the general population. But in, in, in families, these uh, variants, uh, affected families, these variants typically cluster. So even though the, those variants are rare, we expect them to be common in, in, in an affected family. So that's why we now concentrate also on, on, on looking at, 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 uh, at families with myocardial infarction. And for this, we have in Lübeck 22 families. Um, so these are really large families with up to 23 affected family members. And some years ago, we performed some linkage analysis, but these were not really successful. So we do not have any gene or linkage region in which we would expect to find a genetic uh, variant. So in order to actually unravel the genetic cause in these families, um, we have now started to sequence the exomes and the genomes. And during the last part of my uh, talk, I'm going to show you three examples of, of exome sequencing in three of our families. And I'm going to start with a most simple example where we had, an, so this is a family where we didn't have any linkage uh, results, but in the end we were able to find a nonsense mutation. So this is the family we, we analyzed. And, um, so this family, or this is the left arm of the family that is actually affected, and all the affected family members are shown as, 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 as dark symbols, and those that are available for genetic studies are shown in green. So in order to identify the genetic cause, we um, selected three family members for exome sequencing. And I'm not going to go into the details of the filter steps, but we started with around 65,000 variants per exome. And then we applied filters as, for example, um, conservation and, and not present in 1,000 genomes and, and, and with a high functional effect. And we were left with three variants. And of these three variants, actually only one could be validated using Sanger sequencing. So the other two were false positives. And this is a variant in the low-density lipoprotein receptor, which is, of course, a, a known risk, a known gene for coronary artery disease. And it's also a gene that was found uh, using the genome or association studies. If you look at the um, cause segregation of this variant in the, in the family, so this is again a pedigree, but you only see those family members above the age of 60. Uh, and this is because of myocardial infarction is obviously a late onset disease, and we do not expect the young family members to have developed the disease already. Um, so you see that if affected family members carry the variant, whereas in unaffected family members do not. And if you look at the younger, younger generation, you see that uh, none have been affected so far, but we have additional uh, the uh, three uh, family members that actually also carry a variant. So we would expect these three to have a higher risk of myocardial infarction compared to their unaffected or the, the relatives without a mutation. So if you look at the, uh, uh, the variant on a, on a genome level, we see that this is a single base pair substitution, but it is in a splice site mutation. So that leads to the loss of exon 10. So this is an in-frame deletion, but it's a really large deletion of approximately uh, 80 amino acids. And these am amino acids um, code for the class B repeat of the receptor. And this, uh, this domain is really important for the ligand release and recycling. So obviously, the integrity of this receptor might be disturbed by losing all these amino acids. So in order to actually understand how this domain of the receptor influences the disease, uh, we performed the literature search. And by doing so, we actually identified that this variant has been described earlier in 1997 by Peters et al. And then and in these studies, they uh, found that the variant is uh, associated with hypercholesterolemia. So that made us wonder if, if this is also the phenotype in our family. And um, by looking at the cholesterol levels of all the mutation carriers, we found that um, that all mutation carriers actually had an increased level of, 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 uh, of LDL cholesterol. And, and this is a significant difference to those that were not, a, not a mutation carriers. And the reason why we didn't identify hypercholesterolemy as, the, um, uh, as a phenotype in this family is that we have very variable plasma levels, and the index patient had uh, normal cholesterol levels. So let me come to my second example today. Um, this is a family where we actually had a, a weak linkage result, which we, however, did not use when we looked at the exome data. So here again, you, I start by showing you the pedigree. And, and again, you see all the, uh, that this is a severely affected uh, family. And we selected three family members for exome sequencing. And again, we selected three distantly related family members in order to reduce the number of variants that are just shared because they are related and not because it is disease specific. 
So again, we apply the same filter criteria and we're left with two variants. And um, only one of these variants could be validated by Sanger sequencing. And this is a variant in the phosphodiesterase 5A gene, which, which is also a very plausible uh, candidate gene for myocardial infarction. So here again, we look at the cost segregation of this variant in a family. And again, you only see those family members above the age of 60. And here you see that all the affected family members actually carry uh, there it is, carry the variant, and uh, in addition to some of the healthy ones. And in the younger generation, we have none affected so far, but also some mutation carriers. Um, as I already mentioned, we have linkage results in this family, and, and these are the linkage results uh, some years from some years ago. And what you see here is, so the, the, these uh, red um, squares show the, 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 the linkage region. And you see that all the mutation carriers have also the, uh, the linkage region. So since we didn't use this, and, and the variant does not lie within the linkage region, but some base pairs apart. And so we believe since we didn't use this um, linkage results uh, in our analysis that this supports the hypothesis that we actually have found the variant that causes this disease in this family. So, so what is this um, phosphodiesterase 5A? So its main function is actually to convert cyclic GMP to, G, uh, to GMP. And, and you probably know this gene because it's responsible for the smooth muscle relaxation in the cardiovascular system. And if you look at the, um, at the variant on transcript level, you see that um, we have three transcripts of the PDE5A, and the arrow indicates the, the, the variant. And you see that in two of these uh, transcripts, the variant lies in the intron, but it lies in the exon in one of these, um, in one of these uh, transcripts. And in this transcript, it induces an early stop. So that means that so our hypothesis was, okay, so then we have reduced levels of PDE5A. But how does that fit our phenotype? So this is a pathway of the PDE5A, and what you see here, this is, this is uh, the protein that converts the CGMP to GMP. But if we have reduced levels of, of PDE5A, then we would have increased levels of CGP, and that will lead to relaxation. And that will be protective and not actually increasing the risk of myocardial infarction. So that doesn't really fit our phenotype. So we're obviously not there yet. So we started to look at the variant again, and we looked at all the regulatory region of, of, of this genome and um, uh, of the genome surrounding this variant, and we found that this variant is also inside the promoter region of this gene. So that made us wonder what the functional impact actually is. So do we have a stop codon and, and reduced levels of transcript, or do we have a regulatory effect and increased, uh, for example, increased uh, numbers of transcripts uh, since the promoter might be disturbed? And so in order to actually uh, look or, or, or investigate whether the variant actually influences promoter activity, uh, we performed some luciferase assay and, uh, of, of, of the promoter with and without the mutation. So in order to perform the luciferase assay, we selected two uh, affected family members and two unaffected family members in order to make clones. And um, just to show you the pathway again, we would expect that the PDE5A level would increase in order to actually have an increased risk of myocardial infarction. And um, so by looking at the results of the, uh, of the luciferase assay, um, we see that so here you have the wild type and here you have the mutation, and here you have the, the relative activity of the luciferase. And what you see here is that the wild type has a significantly lower, lower uh, activity than you have if you have the mutation. So that would mean, in the end, that we have a gain of function, that this variant um, actually increases the activity of the receptor and in that way um, uh, increases the risk of myocardial infarction. So in the end, um, I want to show you the last example where we also had a family without any linkage results. And this is a family where we identified a diagenic uh, inheritance pattern. So this, again, we saw for the family and we sequenced the exon of three family members. And we applied almost the same filter criteria as I mentioned earlier. But in the end here, we were left with four variants of the Sanger sequencing. And these four variants, we have two nonsense mutation and we have two uh, amino acid changes. So in order to actually identify the gene or, or, or the variant that actually caused the disease, um, we, um, we performed a literature search. And by doing so, we identified that the Gucci 1H3 and the CCT7 interact on a protein level. So how does that look in a pedigree? So here in red, you see all the W mutation carriers, and in blue, you see the single mutation carriers. And what you see is that all the W mutation carriers have a, are affected with myocardial infarction. 
And in addition, single mutation carriers have also a an, an slightly increased risk of, 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 uh, of, uh, of the phenotype. If you look at the, uh, the Gucci 1H3 and the CCD7 on a single level, you see that we have no significant LOD score. So that actually may, means uh, whether the variant co-segregates with the disease. However, if you, if you combine the Gucci 1H3 and the CCD7, you get an LOD score of 5.68. So this is clearly significant and obviously a diagenic um, inheritance. So, so how does this uh, interaction of the Gucci 1H3 and the CCT7 look like? So here you have the Gucci 1H3 and the Gucci 1B3, and these two code for the alpha subunit and the beta sub subunit of the soluble uh, gonolite cyclase. So this complex uh, isn't stable without the chaperone CCT7. So the Gucci 1H3 actually interacts with the CCT7 in order to have a stable complex of, of soluble gonolite cyclase, which converts GTP to CGMP. So if you have a variant in the Gucci 1H3 or in the CCG7, you would expect to have an, uh, an, uh, an impaired uh, complex uh, and an unstable one and it reduced levels of cyclic GMP. So in order just to see why or to explain why we think that a W mutation is really that severe, I want to show you the four possible combinations uh, that can be built if you have a double mutation. So you can have an intact Gucci 1H3 and CCG7 that would look like this. You can have a malformed Gucci 1H3 and a, and a, and a correct CCD7 molecule. And, and correspondingly, you can have a CCD7 which is uh, uh, altered and a Gucci 1H3 which is working. These two are impaired. If you have uh, the Gucci 1H3 and the CCD7 mutation, you would have a loss of, of soluble gunlat cyclase activity, which we were also able to show in our uh, experiments. And the interesting thing is that three quarters of the possible combination that you actually can build are, uh, are altered. So that means if you are a single mutation carrier, you would have 50% working. If you are a double mutation carrier, you have three quarters not working. And this is also something you can show in the experiments. So here you have uh, the, 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 the CGMP formation. So that means more or less the activity of the soluble gonolite cyclase. And here you have the uh, non-mutation carriers, the single mutation carriers, and the double mutation carriers. And what you see here is that you have a significant difference between double mutation carriers and the single mutation carriers. And of course, also to the um, non-mutation carriers. So our hypothesis of the underlying pattern mechanism is the following. So in the platelets, the GTP is converted to CGMP by the soluble granulite cyclase, and this inhibits the platelet aggregation. If you have a dysfunctional soluble gonite cyclase, then you have accelerated uh, platelet aggregation, which is something we also were able to show, and accelerated thrombus formation. And this, in the end, leads to myocardial infarction. So in the end, on my last slide, I want to come back to the, um, the common variants from the start of my presentation. And here you see the, the genomal association results of, uh, of this region. So here you have the genes, and these are the p-values. Uh, you see here, and this is also a gene that was, it was identified using genomal association studies. So this is a gene, so the Gucci 1H3 harbors common variants with low effect size and obviously also rare variants with higher effect size. So to conclude, um, I want to uh, mention that um, we now know several risk genes that actually have a little series of common and rare variants. And examples are, for example, the Gucci 1H3 and the LDL receptor gene. And we believe that the low frequency and the rare variants actually explain uh, or will explain the missing heritability so far, and that exome sequencing is a valuable tool in order to identify these risk loci. And using exome sequencing, we can identify new risk gene and in that, in that way also um, get a better understanding of the mechanism that underlie the disease. Uh, in addition, I also want to point out that we believe that uh, this is a step towards personalized medicine since exome sequencing can be used for diagnosis so that you know which mechanism actually is disturbed and you can allow for preventive treatment of so far unaffected relatives. So in the end, I want to thank uh, my group in Lübeck, uh, the group of Janet Erdmann, and our close collaborators uh, in Munich, all our sponsors, and you for your attention. <laughs>